I wonder if you would turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Looking at, starting at verse 18, says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. This morning... I want to talk to you in regards to these scripture verses, in regards to two words that are put together there that says eagerly waits, eagerly waiting. It's interesting that on this Pentecostal Sunday, this Sunday that is honor of the festival of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured forth, is that Jesus, prior to being uh, ascended into heaven, told his disciples in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, he says, to tarry in Jerusalem. Basically, tarry meaning wait. Wait in Jerusalem for the promise. Then in Acts, chapter 1, verse 4, it picks up once again as Luke is describing the coming of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, wait. Wait in Jerusalem. Wait. The word that is used there, wait, is to not depart but basically to sit down or settle in and wait for it to come to pass. And so that's what they did. They went to Jerusalem and they sang psalms and prayed and and enjoyed one another's company and looking at scripture and waited for, settled in, meaning not to depart. Conversely, to wait, to stay there. Wait for this to come upon you. The promise of the Holy Spirit. But in this Romans chapter 8, there's a different word that's used there for eagerly waits. As a matter of fact, we need those two words put together in order to make that word happen. Eagerly waits, eagerly waiting. As I pondered on eagerly waiting, it made me wonder about like, how do you eagerly, eagerly, doesn't it sound like a a sense of anxiousness, a sense of going after, a a patience, a patience? But I mean, uh, 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 but when you put eagerly with waiting, it's kind of like, well, if I'm waiting, aren't I supposed to be like at a time of rest and kind of settling back and waiting for something? But it says to do it eagerly. How do you eagerly wait? Like that jumbo shrimp thing, you know? It's like a child who's waiting for Christmas and they're eagerly waiting. I don't know if I saw a child eagerly wait for they're eagerly pursuing, they're eagerly, eagerly wait. And what are we eagerly waiting? It says that there's a revealing of the sons of God that's about to take place. That this idea of eagerly waiting is looking for, with attention, going after. It captures your attention. You're looking for it. You're willing to wait for its coming, and yet you're in the constant attentive state. You're waiting for this to dawn, for it to come forth, to be revealed, and you're in a constant, perpetual, attentive state, expecting it. (sighs) Expecting it to come any moment. You're in this state where you realize that this is about to dawn, and you're enthusiastic about it, that you're not paying attention to anything else except looking for that to happen. And you're actually in a point of pursuit, waiting for it to dawn in your life, 
waiting for something to dawn in your, over the horizon, waiting for that darkness to be dispelled when full light is made known and a person is eagerly perceiving, pursuing, expectant, zealous, enthusiastic about, I can't wait till this will happen. It's kind of like children when they're ready for baseball season to start and they're, they're looking for and they're planning on and they're checking the calendar and, they're, and it captures their attention and they're, and they're talking about it. Maybe something's going on in your life, such as a, if, you've, if you remember the time when you were about to be married, and I saw a Facebook comment today of a, of a, of a friend who's attending or attended a wedding of this woman who is getting, was getting married yesterday, and she, she, she was going to bed on Friday night and says, I can't even sleep. I'm, I can't wait for. I'm enthusiastic about. I, my life is about to change tomorrow, and she's eagerly waiting. But she's not thinking about all these other peripheral things around her life that could very easily consume her thoughts, her attention, the affections of her heart. She's not looking to say, oh, that's my favorite TV show. I I can't wait to watch it. Her mind is all focused on the event that's about to happen. But she has to wait for it. She's waiting for it to unfold. She's eager, enthusiastic waiting to realize that when I get up in the morning, it's time to get ready and it's time to realize and put my dress on and get my makeup done and people and talk because my event is about to happen. I'm eager about it, enthusiastic, and I'm waiting because there's nothing else I can do except keep focused on and realize that's about to happen. Paul, in writing to the Romans, uses it three times in that section of Scripture Eagerly waits, eagerly waiting for things to take place. This enthusiasm that consumes his heart, mind, and soul. You want it to happen. Your attention is on it. Think of it, kids, as to when you're eager about something. I want want this to happen. Soccer, baseball, Christmas morning. Emma. Did you know that you're about to get a horse? It's like, you're going to be able to have your own horse, name your own horse. You know I'm not, that's not the truth, right? Okay. (laughs) But what would it do to your heart? Like, do you know that next month, the first of the month, June 1st, that we're going to go as a church, buy you a horse. We're not going to tell mom and dad. (laughs) And we're going to deliver it to your house. What would happen to her heart? Right? I'm about to get a, yep, bring saddle. We'll even put nail polish on its hooves. <laughs> but all of a sudden, it's like, I'm going to have my, I'm going to be able to ride. I'm going to be able to, yes, that's, I'm looking forward. All of a sudden, May 18th, May 19th, May 20, May 21, May 22, May 23. See, uh, just watching that calendar. Hey, do you want to, and you're looking forward, and everything you're doing is what? You're captured with the idea that that day is coming. And I'm waiting for it. I want it to happen. What's capturing our attention that we're eagerly waiting for? What are we looking to do? And Mike just went to Ghana, and he kept, what, checking the dates. Checking the dates. The date is coming. The date is coming. What wedding that date where you knew, that time where you knew you were going to get that gift, that, that horse, that cat, the expectancy of a child being born, where all of a sudden you, I'm pregnant. I mean, not me, but yeah. <laughs> you understand, right? <laughs> but all of a sudden you, and you wait, and all of a sudden you see, yeah. <laughs> and you see that and you realize something's about to take place and this growth, this, this birth, this, it's going to, and all of a sudden the revelation the, of the child of born. You, we're waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, the saints, the children of the Lord, to be born, to be brought forth, to realize, saying, 
there the baby is. There the sons are. They're, that's who they really are. That's what they really look like. That's, we've been eagerly waiting for. And the sun rises and the sun sets and the earth turns and you're waiting for this to develop and you're waiting for it. And in the meantime, it should be capturing your attention, hence the word eagerly waiting. It captures your attention. We get so sidetracked with all of the other things. I've, I've been sidetracked just trying to, how am I going to get my lawn done and I've got to get the, the, the weed whacking done and I've got to get, and you don't realize all of a sudden that that's all you're thinking about? You say, what am I doing? Grass is capturing my attention. I can get a goat to do that. All of a sudden, you're eagerly waiting no longer for this. You're eagerly waiting for, I've got to get this done, I've got to get that done. And all of a sudden, you're realizing my mind isn't focused on what it should be anymore. How, how did that so easily happen? And Paul is writing to the church in Rome and he's, the Holy Spirit's writing to us saying that we must be people who are not led astray. Don't get your attention off. Don't be distracted. Don't let anything attract your attention from. We're so easily led astray. So true? This isn't a you thing. This isn't just a me thing. This is a we thing. We get distracted by something else where all of a sudden that we're, our attention goes elsewhere. I've seen people who have been highly, highly excited about just, and I remember, I'm thinking of my dad, how he just couldn't wait to get to Florida and play golf the rest of his life. That was his whole, his attention was, I, I'm going to sell the business, I'm selling the house, I'm selling everything, I'm going to Florida, and I'm just going to play golf. He was so excited about going to Florida until he realized that that little white ball can drive you crazy. And all of a sudden, it was just consumed with, i got to hit that ball better. How come? And it's slicing this way. And I'll, I'll get new golf clubs, and I'll get a new cart, and I'll get a new trainer, and I'll, get a, I'll change golf courses. And, it, you know, eventually, the only way you can settle this is to go to miniature golf. <laughs> now it's, his whole focus, he was an avid going after. It captured his attention where, nothing, I'm telling you, nothing else mattered. It, he couldn't wait to get up in the morning and just play. But all of a sudden you realize that it's empty, left you empty. You, you get to a point where you did well one day and lousy the next and you, you couldn't, ca and, and it just dissipated. And sometimes that can happen in our pursuit of the things of God. We get so easily distracted with this and distracted with that and we are led astray and we're, we're focused on all the things of this world and our own frets and our own fears, our anxieties, the way we want things to work out. Why can't it be? And we start coming up with reasons the way it should be and, and all of a sudden we're no longer focused on the eagerly waiting of the revealing of the sons of God. We're no longer looking for the great gift. We're no longer looking for the revelation of God. We're looking instead for things to work out the way we want them to. And Paul is writing to the church and hence the Holy Spirit is writing to us and calling for us to be people that are eagerly waiting for. And we have to ask ourselves, what are we really eagerly pursuing, waiting for, looking for, capturing our attention to, to evolve and to show itself forth in our lives? And he says here in Scripture, he says here that, it's, that it has to do with the idea in verse 23 of the, the redemption of our body they're eagerly waiting for the adoption. Eagerly waiting for the adoption. Now, you and I could probably look and say, well, we're, and even kids, you can think about and say, uh, for you did not, uh, eagerly waiting, uh, verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, you have the Spirit of the living God, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. The Holy Spirit groaning in you eagerly waiting for the adoption. Eagerly waiting for the adoption. Where you finally belong. Imagine adoption goes in relationship to orphan. Where a person who has a family, children, think of it now, you got a family, you're going home and you go and you got a mom or a dad, you got, you got a family, you got a home, you got a place, you got an identity, you got a last name. But there have been orphans down through the years that don't have a last name. They don't have an identity. They don't have a home. And if somebody's coming to the orphanage, somebody's coming to the adoption house, and they're looking at the children and the kids are there, maybe it's me. Maybe I'll be. 
I've got a family member who can understand that. And maybe this will be my home. Maybe this will be my last name. Maybe that's my mom and dad. Then all of a sudden you find stories where the child reached a certain age and they said, I'm too old to be adopted. They always choose the younger ones. And so I'm left. I told you the story of this man, Billy Washington, from Zion, 95 years old, who stood up and praised the Lord. And he says, I was an orphan, me and my twin brother. I had no last name in the sense of no identity. My parents were gone. I lived in an orphanage. and I, My home was that big building with everybody else. And people took care of me, but they weren't mom and dad. And you wondered as to where I'm going until finally, and I've told you the story in time past, when he and his brother are walking down the sidewalk, and do you remember the Sunday school teacher who said, hey, you, come to my Sunday school tomorrow. And they did. And here he is now at 95 years old, declaring, God has been good to me. That orphan, all of a sudden he hears the word, hey, next week you're being adopted. We've got a fine home for you, a mom, a dad, a place for you to live, a bed to sleep in, an identity, a purpose, brothers and sisters, and you're being brought in and you're going to have a place. You can bet that child is going to be eagerly waiting for that adoption, that day. You have been adopted, where? Into the family of God. Brothers and sisters in heaven. And we are eagerly waiting for the adoption. Eagerly waiting when when the seal is stamped and it's done and you're brought home. And the Lord of glory introduces you to the Father, the one who sired your new creation. When all of a sudden you realize that your body, this old, tired body, all of a sudden it says that we're not just waiting for the adoption, but the redemption of our body. The glorious body that no man can describe. Hear me now. The glorious body that no man can describe. It has not yet been described by human lips. It has not yet been defined by human thought what the body of Christ actually looks like. It is not known. It says one day you will be seeing him as he really is and you'll be just like him, but you do not know what that is. And in this, we're waiting, eagerly waiting for that to take place. As a matter of fact, all of creation is waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. And it says in verse 25, But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. There's a pursuit to it. We're eagerly waiting with a pursuit for it, desiring for it to come into our lives eagerly waiting for the kingdom of God. But it cannot happen unless humility is the bedrock. It does not happen unless love for the Lord, love for the kingdom. It's so easily to be distracted when you don't have a love for someone. It's so easily to be distracted by another when there's not a love or an adoration present. Any husband or wife team When somebody has lost the love for their spouse, it's so easy to put their focus on someone else. It becomes so easy. Why? Because that love has been been distracted. It has gotten off track. Same way with the things of God. How easily we can be all of a sudden lose that touch, lose that love, lose that adoration. And it says in the Bible, even in what it says, they lost their first love. They're focused on this, the church of Ephesus. They were focused on all these things in the book of Revelation. They lost their first love, and they become eager about everything except what matters, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. No longer crying out for the adoption, no longer crying out for, there's still a love for, we can be so in love with ministry that we miss out on a love for the kingdom. We can be so in love with doing unto the Lord that we forget about what he's doing in us. And it's instead learning and saying, Lord, do your work. Am I eagerly waiting for? It says in 1 Corinthians 1.7. 1 Corinthians 1.7 says, Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The revelation, the apocalypsis, the knowing and seeing for who he really is. 
Galatians 5.5 5 says this, For through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For through the Spirit, eagerly wait, look for, desire, pay attention to. Let it capture all of your attention. For what? For the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all the same word that is used as it was in Romans, is the same word that's being used here. Philippians 3.20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We eagerly wait for the Savior. Once again, not just settling in, not sitting down passively, not just kind of in the sense of that you're waiting without care or concern. Ah, oh, when it happens, it happens. What happens doesn't matter to me. No, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about an eager wait that, can't, that you're, you're, you're at the point of a full attention is being paid and ready to see that dawn in your life as we use the examples of a wedding or a horse for a child. Wanting that to take place. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 9 says in verse 28 of chapter 9, Hebrews, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait of him, for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Let me read that again. So Christ was offered once. He was offered once and will never be offered again. That's why it is finished. And in Revelation it says it is done. He was offered once for the purpose of to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait. Same word that we saw in Romans 8 is the same word here. These two English words are put together to bring full meaning to it. Eagerly waiting, eagerly wait for him, who? The Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior. Eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. Who will he appear to a second time? To who? To those who eagerly wait. Therefore, why such strong emphasis on this? Because to see, to recognize, to know, to be experienced, to see the second coming of the Lord to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear, it's a promise, a second time. But this time, it's apart from sin. This time, it's for salvation. The verse before that, 27, says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Men die once, then the judgment. Christ died once for the sins of many. But for those who eagerly wait, he will appear a second time. Apart from sin, no longer going to the cross, now in full glorified state, he'll be revealed as he really is. And Romans 8 says that the sons of God were waiting for this. With it says that the revealing of the sons of God will take place. We're going to see him as he really is because you'll be just like him, 1 John 3, 2. So it starts coming to realize who you are, that this should be capturing our attention. Many people today going to church are more concerned about where they're going to eat than they are about serving the Lord. Many people today are more concerned about the buffet table than they are the communion table. More people are concerned today about what they drive and where they live than having an abode with the kingdom of God. It's coming to a revelation and an understanding that we are called to eagerly wait. The Spirit of God does this in us. There's no other way to attain it. You can't work up the fervor. You can't work up the zeal. You can't work up the enthusiasm. Instead, it's recognizing there's a promise of God that is coming. And now is resting in my own heart and in your heart, calling for us to eagerly wait for the revelation 
of Jesus Christ, the Savior, and the redemption of our bodies, and the adoption being brought into the family of God, where Christ himself will introduce us to the Father. The natural man wars against this. The natural man rejects this. The natural man and the things of this world is so concerned only about the things that they can see, touch, taste, feel, hear. But the Spirit of God in us rejects those things, pushes them aside, and is encaptured, encaptured uh, enamored with the presence of God, the coming of the Lord. Seeing, all of a sudden recognizing that this is really going to take place. That's right. Saints of God, this is really going to take place. Where all of a sudden you recognize, you mean what pastor said on May 19th, 2013 is true? Yes. You're telling me that on May 19th, 2013, that all that was said about the coming of the Lord is really going to happen? Yes. And it matters that I keep my mind, my heart, my life focused on the kingdom of God, that I must serve the, the king, that I recognize the coming of the Lord, the savior of the world, that he's coming in a full glorified state, and he's coming for me. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And you'll recognize that all those who've been scowling at you and scorning, rejecting, I don't want any part of this, I don't want any part of that, that's foolish. They'll be shown for the perishing souls that they are. That God Almighty has raised you up out of the muck and the mire, out of the swamp of sin that all ensnares us, and has put a new life in you and has set you on solid ground and taken you out of the muck and the mire with the alligator's reign, seeking whom they may devour. And he's put you on solid ground. And he's put your eyes on the kingdom of the Lord that's about to dawn. And every sunrise proves that the Lord is about to dawn and no darkness will reside. That God Almighty is coming back and he's calling for you and I to eagerly wait. And it comes by the Spirit of God. That God's Spirit is in you in such a way that bubbles up and fuels up. And there's so many things that we can give our lives to. And there's many things that I personally also enjoy. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when those become our idols, I know that right today, Adam has put together a whole get-together to play baseball with all the kids. And to, I think that is fantastic. He's, he's looking forward to it. I don't know about the kids, but I know someone is. Where all of them are going to get together, play, and he's been looking forward to that day and planning and calling and emailing and setting up and arranging. And he's looking forward. He's been eagerly waiting for that day to come. Just in case you're not interested, there's somebody else is. Wanting to see and just enjoying and planning and envisioning what it could be like. And he's eagerly waiting for the gathering of all the young saints where they can play ball together and enjoy the things of God. Fantastic. But what's causing that and what's fueling that is a greater eagerly waiting. What's moving in his heart, what's moving in the kids, what's moving in the families, what's desiring to have this take place is the revelation, the understanding that there's a greater eagerly waiting taking place. And that's the coming of the Lord who's already set up his home in his heart and in the kids' hearts. That it doesn't steal away, rather it builds up. That doing these other things doesn't steal away from the coming of the Lord. Rather, it is because of the coming of the Lord that those things take place. That they take on a purpose that goes beyond just playing ball. There's a relational aspect. There's a love exchanged. There's a faithfulness exposed. There's a desire to see kids and families coming together, live for the glory of the Lord. Much more than just playing a ball. Anybody can go out there and play ball. But not everybody can do it with an eagerly waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. What we're talking about today is more of you, less of me. What we're talking about today is the Holy Spirit alive in us who will appear a second time to those who are eagerly waiting for his coming. That you don't want to be taken by surprise. You mean it's today? I didn't, I didn't know it. Well, no one knows, but were you looking for that the moment that that trumpet hears, you know what it is. The moment that you see it's there, 
The moment it happens, you did, it didn't take you by surprise. You've been expecting it. Like Simeon, who was looking for the consolation of Israel. And he says, now I can die. I've seen the consolation of Israel. That God Almighty has been moving in our lives and in our heart to recognize the coming of the Lord. What's actively missing today is the preaching of the coming of the Lord. Everybody's been preaching and teaching and encouraging and blessing about what you can get in this life. And God Almighty, by His Spirit, is calling for you and I to get our focus on what's coming, not what is. That even Jesus, who was offered the kingdoms of this earth, pushed them aside and said, no, there's a kingdom that's coming. He is the kingdom. And recognizing that God has not just made a promise, He's put that promise in your heart. The Holy Spirit in you is the promise of God. Live for God, eagerly waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, eagerly waiting for the adoption, eagerly waiting for the redemption of the body, eagerly waiting with perseverance, pushing onward and upward to the higher calling of Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody steal it. Don't let anybody ensnare you in a trap of lies. Don't anything, anything be peripheral, drawing your attention away. But be fueled today for the coming of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Adam, That's what it's come. all about. Having eyes for the kingdom. It says in the latter day that men's hearts will wax cold. They'll lose the love of God. That people will just go their own way. Lord, protect us. How does that happen? Humility. Humility. Ha humble hearts. Lord, have your way in me. That's what the Lord is doing, touching our lives. As I said, and say again, that the enemy of your soul wants to stir that old nature, the natural man, the pride, the respect, the fair play, the desire to have. Lord, keep me humble. Keep us in a humble state. It'll be worth it. When all is seen and done the way it's, when you see it the way it really is, it'll be worth it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord of glory, thank you for this church, for these people. Thank you, Lord of glory, for this country birthed in prayer by holy men of God, women of God, who put you first, foremost in their life. Thank you for preserving this country, even in the midst of our evil ways. Because men and women sacrificed and prayed for. Lord, would you move on us one more time and bring us our country into a state of humility where we can once again be a country that glorifies your name. That we would be a nation of goodness because the Lord is in the house. That you would touch this church, small but powerful. Men and women giving their life to you and changing into the very presence of the Lord among us. Salt of the earth, light of the world. That you today, Lord, would be with, be with Mike and encourage him and keep him faithful. And keep him filled with the love and the holiness of God. That you'd bless, Lord, each and every person who's giving from the sustenance that you've blessed them with. They're taking, cutting checks, taking out cash, putting it in a bag and saying, unto you, O Lord. I pray your blessing upon their faithfulness. Lord of glory, that you touch these children who have listened. I trust that they learn to eagerly wait for the revealing of the sons of God. That the children would eagerly wait as they grow before you. Protect their hearts, minds, and souls to say, I have decided to follow Jesus. And they would have an eagerly waiting spirit for the redemption of the body, for the adoption that you have waiting for them, that they would know the Father. Father in heaven, bless each and every person in this building and their respective families. Keep us sound in you, we pray. Move upon our communities, our neighborhoods, our lost loved ones who have not a clue of who you are or don't care. Lord, would you touch them with the mighty hand of God. 
Thank you, Lord of glory, for using this church to change lives. Thank you for our homes, our jobs, the food we're about to eat today. Thank you for the beautiful weather. Thank you for this, for your blessing. Lord, truly, it's in your name that we've preached. It's in your name we've praised. It's in your name we pray. It's in your name that we give. It's in your name we glory. It's in your name. Amen? Amen. 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 Gentlemen, would you?